Thank you for joining us today. The Conference on Reproducibility and Replicability in Economics and the Social Sciences is a series of discussions by specialists and practitioners on the topics of reproducibility, replicability, and transparency. This is the sixth session. If you miss any of the previous sessions, we've posted them on YouTube. The link is on our website. Our panels discuss educational and procedural barriers slowing down adoption, whether journals or institutions or funders should be the verifiers of reproducibility, whether and how scientists' work can be made to be repro re reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at the inception and data collection stage, and implications for the training of undergraduate and graduate students. My name is Marie Connolly, and I'm today's moderator, also member of the organizing committee. I would like to introduce Lars Biluber and Alex Michuda, the co-PIs of CREST, and Ian Schmidt, fellow member of our organizing committee and host of some future webinars. Finally, Sarah Brooks, who keeps the wheels going. They'll be on mute for most of this panel, but Lars and Alex will be monitoring the Q&A and relaying any questions. I really hope you enjoyed today's webinar institutional support. How do journal reproducibility verification services work? We look forward to hearing from our expert panelists and to your questions. Without further ado, let's introduce our panelists. Today, we are joined by three panelists. Christophe Perignon, Professor of Finance and Associate Dean for Research at HEC Paris, France. He is also the co-holder of the ACPR Banque de France, Chair in Regulation and Systemic Risk. We invited him to this panel as the co-founder of CASCAD, a certification service for scientific code and data. Ben Greiner, professor at WU Vienna, Institute for Markets and Strategy, where he works on behavioral and experimental economics and market design topics. He's also the code and data editor of the journal Management Science where all accepted papers have to provide replication packages that are reviewed for completeness. To my Christian, Assistant Director for Archives at the Odom Institute for Research in Social Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the Odom Institute Data Archive, as well as establishing and enforcing policies in accordance with archival standards and best practice. The Odom Institute was one of the first to conduct reproducibility checks for scientific articles on behalf of the American Journal of Political Science. Question to you, Christophe Perignon. Cascade was set up both to support pre-submission verification of replication packages with a certificate, as well as support of verification of confidential data in the French RDC system. Can you talk about the motivation for setting up Cascade and the experience so far? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marie, uh, for the invitation. Thanks to Lars and uh, Alex. Uh, yes, you're, you're right. Cascade is a, is a reproducibility verification service, and we operate in France. Um, we work with uh, several academic journals in economics, hence uh, me uh, being with you uh, tonight. But this is not the only thing we, we do at Cascade, as you will see. Uh, going back to your question about the, the reason why we created Cascade, I, I guess there are multiple reasons, but the, the starting point for us with a with my colleague Christophe Furlan, was uh, our strong conviction that uh, if you take science seriously, you, you really need to take uh, reproducibility seriously. If you want the, the chain of science to be strong and useful for society, uh, you do not want reproducibility to be the, the, the weakest link. Uh, so we, we first launched Run My Code uh, like 10 years ago to allow researchers to share the code and data associated with their publication. Uh, so it's an online uh, code and data archive system. Uh, like Zenodo, ICPSR, etc. Uh, but then uh, we realize that when researchers they, they just share their code and data, they often they don't share all the necessary ingredients, all the code, all the data, all the information we need. So as a result, uh, sometimes uh, you just cannot regenerate their results. Uh, the reason why they don't share is that sometimes they they cannot share because of uh, legal reasons, copyright or NDA is assigned, or sometimes you just don't want to share everything. So it's a little bit frustrating for, for all the researchers not being able to reproduce everything. And for us, even more problematic was a situation when even when all the ingredients are available, 
you sometimes have a hard time because of bugs or lack of information to run everything. So again, it was it was a, a concern for us. And um, and even when the code runs, sometimes you're still unable to generate exactly the result that you find in the paper. So that was kind of the starting point of this discussion with, with Christophe, my, my colleague, and then you say, okay, what can we do to improve things? And then we said that we really need another layer of verification. And then we say, why don't why not creating a third party? Hence the, the cascade agency that, that we operate now. Uh, and this third party would allow researchers to uh, signal the reproducibility of their research. Of their research. Uh, what they need to do is they provide us with all these so-called ingredients called data information, and we will try to regenerate the result. And if we are successful in doing so, we can deliver a certificate to them. So it's very early in the process. It's before they submit their paper and they can communicate about the certificate. For example, they can add this when they submit uh, their, their manuscript to, to a paper. Uh, one thing was very important for us is this concept of non-shareable data. Uh, we often in economics, oh, we cannot share those data. But for us, non-shareable data is very different from non-accessible data. Um, we can, I think I already heard Lars talking about that. There, we can always access data. It's just like for some data, it's, it's very time consuming. It, it, it's, it's difficult in terms of uh, you know, uh, administrative burden, but, but we can do it. Most of the time we can access data which are so-called non-shareable to start with. Another thing which is very important for us is this notion of economies of scale, because we are, um, we are a centralized uh, agency. We work with many journals, many researchers, many uh, data providers. So I think there is a lot of economy of scale and we exploit part of them uh, within Cascade, but we'll be able to go back to this. So as you can see, we work with researchers so we can help them to signal the reproducibility of their research. We work with data providers because they can they see us as kind of uh, an extra service they can, they can provide to their, uh, to their users. And you mentioned the, the partnership we have with CISD. CISD in France is a, uh, is a, is a data provider for confidential and very granular administrative data in France. Uh, they, they allow uh, researchers uh, in France, but uh, also in Europe and also in uh, everywhere in the world to, to access and analyze those so-called confidential data coming from uh, French public administration ministries and, and INSEE, the French Institute of Statistics and Economic Studies. So a lot of juicy and uh, confidential data um, uh, 378 sources, uh, 742 research teams in the world using this data. And one little exercise that we, we did here, we collect all the publication within three years using CISD. We end up with 134 articles published collectively 91 journals. So at Cascade, what we do is we reproduce the result based on this confidential data. If those 91 journals, they had to access this data that would be very, very uh, uh, time consuming from them to go through this lengthy accreditation. So that's one example of what I mean by economies of scale. So I will stop here back to you, uh, back to you, Marie, and we can talk some more afterwards, I guess. Yes, thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, now we will move to Ben, Ben Greiner. Um, ben, you have been reviewing articles and their replication packages in management science for nearly three years. How has this process been received by authors and editors? And how's the, how does the process work for authors? Uh, thanks, Marie. Um, uh, thank you for having me. I'm happy to talk a little bit about what uh, we do at Management Science and how it works, um, and also the challenges we face. Um, now, um, how does it work at Management Science? So. Uh, it's a little bit different also to uh, how it works at the American Economic Association. Um, so when authors submit their paper to the journal, they also have to complete a code and data disclosure form. And basically, they have three options. Either no data or code is involved in a paper, so they have, don't have to uh, provide the replication packages, or they follow our policy that they have to provide all code and data. Or the third alternative is that they offer propose an alternative disclosure plan for multiple reasons like uh, proprietary uh, data and so on. Um, then during the review process, the department editor, um, when accepting a paper, should also confirm this disclosure plan. So it should be part of the trade-off uh, the department editor makes. Uh, how important is the paper? How transparent 
um, is the is the analysis. Um, after acceptance, the authors then submit their final manuscript to the editorial office as well as their application packages. And this is where we come into place. So I'm the code and data editor at the journal and there are three associate editors which support me. And what we basically do is we verify whether the code and data package is complete. So whether there's code and data for each table figure result in a main manuscript, that's what we focus on. Um, but we do not really check whether it's reproducible. So we do not compare the numbers. We just don't have the capacity for that. Currently, we are all just volunteers helping out here. And if there are issues, there is back and forth communication with the authors. And after we came to a result, we then verify, uh, verify uh, the, the compliance with our policy and the uh, paper goes to production. So let me give you some numbers of our operations. Um, now, since April 2020, we started reviewing uh, since the, the new policy came into effect at Management Science. And by now we have reviewed about 530 papers and their application packages. And you see there's some seasonal variation and uh, there's also an increase over time because more and more papers uh, fall under the new policy. Uh, we expect that in the long term, there will be about 300 papers uh, per year to be reviewed by us. Now, uh, management science is very diverse. There are many departments. Uh, so we have papers from finance, from accounting, from behavioral economics, but also marketing, operations management. So for all kinds of fields. So we have a very diverse set of topics there. And we uh, most of the papers we review are actually empirical papers, but they are also lab experiments, field experiments, survey data, or there are uh, papers actually which are pure theory or uh, simulation or algorithm papers, which also involve some code, and uh, but often no data at all. Now, also in terms of the software they use, uh, they are very diverse. Uh, um, it differs obviously whether it's a theory paper or a paper which only works with code or if it's papers with data. But in our journal, at least, data is the most dominant uh, software used for uh, papers with data. But we also have R, SAS, MATLAB, and Python. And we have many other uh, uh, software environments we have to be aware of and be able to use in order to review the, uh, the, the, um, the papers and replication packages. Um, in about 50% of our replication packages, the data, which are based on data, uh, the data is actually included. Uh, so we have many papers which rely on either subscription data or company internal data and so on. So um, for 50% for the data can be included, for the other 50% it's not. Some articles also have partial data at least, but um, uh, um, not many. And so the, these these papers where the origin data cannot be included for licensing reason and so on. And um, uh, we we have to deal with that somehow. Now, for these data, for these um, packages, at least 50% of the data is at least publicly accessible by subscription, for example. So via Wharton Research Databases, Comstat, or other uh, government websites and, um, and, and providers. Um, we're pushing more and more on that uh, if the data, the origin data cannot be included, at least synthetic data or sample data is included, so we can verify the code with the data, even though we cannot reproduce necessarily the results. Uh, and sometimes we can also convince the authors that they'd only uh, disguise the data, so it's not reusable for any other purpose than, than uh, the reproducibility um, of, the, of the paper. Now a little bit about the process and how it works, uh, so the, the statistics about how we work and, and how fast we are, for example, and what we do. So. In the end, as I said, uh, there, we reviewed about 500 papers so far. For the large majority, actually, it's the case that only I look at it and try to verify it. So I deal with most papers which don't include data, so we can't run the code anyway. Um, but I delegate uh, quite a few papers to my associate editors, uh, especially because I have associate editors who are experts in Python and Stata and SAS or in R. So I can distribute some of the workload, especially when we run the code. And we can run the code. Um, um, so in 64% of the papers, we can actually check the code as well, that the code runs through from beginning to end. And 36% of the papers we cannot check because either we don't have the capabilities or licenses to run the code, so some softwares uh, we do just don't have access to, uh, or we don't have access to the data, so there's no way for us to actually 
uh, check whether the code um, is uh, is valid. In these cases, we always ask for log files, so we want to see that at least the authors can prove that the code runs through on their own uh, on their own in their own environment. Now, only unfortunately, only thirty percent of the packages which get submitted initially can be accepted as is. Um, the majority of papers, more than 50%, have to go through one round of revisions where we send them an email and ask them for detail, uh, give them lots of details about how, what they have to fix and um, um, what they have to do. Um, and some papers even need more rounds of revisions and back and forth with the authors until we arrive at a package which we deem acceptable. Now it takes some time. So one big worry at management science was that it adds to the to the review process, and it does. So this is the total time uh, it spends with us in a review, from us taking it into the review until it goes out. Um, uh, I winterized this data a little bit because we have some outliers here, some far outliers where it took more than a year for authors to provide their algorithm code, for example. But the average is about um, uh, 26 days that it stays in our review. Um, when you break it down, about 10 of these days, 11 of these days, it stays with us uh, at the, uh, the part uh, with the um, data and code editors and associate editors. Um, and about 16 days, it stays with the authors because they review their um, their their paper, their application packages, and, um, and revise them. Um, Sometimes we have to involve editors, which have to prove of changes in the paper um, uh, because of the uh, as a result of the of the review process, and they are usually quite quick. So in ten percent of the cases, we have to involve department editors, and um, and and they uh, they are usually quite quick in responding to our requests. Now, what is the typical issues we detect? Um, I distinguished here between code only papers and uh, papers with data. So often some code is missing. Um, we actually also detect errors in code. So keep in mind that we only code check 64% uh, of the papers. So these 20% uh, 4% uh, errors in code means that actually uh, more than one third of the replication packages which are originally submitted have code which is faulty and which doesn't run through from beginning to end. And we ignore here any kind of you know path setting or simple errors. We talk about real code errors. Um, sometimes data is missing, but most of the cases we actually ask for better documentation of data, uh, uh, of, of data sources. And uh, we ask for step-by-step -step guides on how to recreate the data sets, or we ask for other documentation, for example, log files and so on. Um, as you see, the data uh, issues are obviously not present in code-only papers. There's mostly about documentation. Now, what are the consequences of our review? Interestingly, in about six percent of the papers we review, uh, there has to be have to be some changes made in the paper. It's as I said, we don't actually compare the numbers, but the authors re often rerun their own analysis and they find mistakes just because of the review process, because they have to revise their application packages. In these cases, we involve the department editors to have another look at these changes and whether they change the result of the paper. I think we only had two papers, which as a consequence had to go back into the review process. Um, the, all the other papers, it was typically just rounding errors or er small uh, changes in standard errors or whatever, so that the results of the papers did not change yet. This is our process. Uh, there are quite a few challenges we face. Um, in particular, um, so far our process is completely manual. So there's no procedural support in the article handling systems. Uh, so Management Science uses Manuscript Central, Scholar One, uh, but I'm also not aware that Elsevier's um, submission system has any support for data and code review at any stage, either as a last review stage or as a post acceptance stage. Um, another challenge, is for us at least that the review happens after the acceptance decision. So the incentives for authors to quickly uh, provide complete replication packages and carefully um, uh, put them together are lower than if it would be before the acceptance uh, decision. So if it would be only conditional acceptance, um, but uh, because many of our authors, I mean, as our assistant profs who need quick uh, decisions because they are on a tenure process, uh, management science decided to put the data review after um, 
after the acceptance decision. So there's a trade-off here. Um, now, in addition, so far, we are not financially supported. There's no budget. Uh, we are all volunteers uh, putting our volunteer work in there. And um, that is an issue which is currently discussed also with other journals at different forms at the society which publishes uh, management science. And we will put, we are pushing for more support here, uh, um, structural support. As a result is that we currently, because we try to review really each article and each replication package, we currently have a large backlog. So we have about a hundred paper backlog where we could not yet take in these papers into the review. We are working on putting, uh, getting it down, but it's a big challenge for us because we are all researchers who have um, other lives outside this. Um, now, all that said, uh, um, as a last thing, I want to plug something which we're currently running. So as said, we only review um, uh, the completeness of the replication packages so far, but not the reproducibility. So we initiated a large scale project now where we want to assess the reproducibility of papers, uh, articles at management science. And um, before and after this 2019 policy change, which in, uh, introduced the review. So my um, my associate editors and I um, are coordinating this together with Elena Kartok, who is a department editor at Management Science. So what we do, we sampled about 300 papers uh, from before the policy change, which have been accepted in 2018 and uh, beginning of 2019. Only 42 of these actually submitted replication packages even though this was strongly encouraged even back then. But we also review all 450 papers uh, with replication packages, which we had after the policy change and until the start of our project. And um, we did put out a call for reviewers and we got almost like 900 people signed up to review and help out in this project. Um, they are all volunteers. So we emailed via to management science reviews and to, through mailing lists. And uh, we then matched them to papers based on the departments on the, on the broad uh, field, like finance, accounting, and so on, on their software skills, which we asked them for, and their data access, the general access to subscription databases. And by now, about 750 reviewers already accepted an assignment. So you see there are more reviews than papers. So we could actually assign many papers uh, twice. Uh, so we can get at least two people trying to reproduce the results. And it's all about reproduction only, right? So we only ask them, can you, based on the materials which are provided in the replication packages, can you reproduce the results printed in the paper? So it's not about soundness of the analysis and anything like that. So far, we already got 230 reports in. Uh, the deadline for most uh, reports is at the end of March now. So we hope actually to have a report ready about this uh, large project by the end of summer. Um, so that's me. I hope I could give you um, a nice overview of what we're doing here. And I'm handing over back to Marie and uh, to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I, I am also the data editor at the Kane Journal of Economics. And your, 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 what you do at Management Science uh, sounds a lot like what I do, um, maybe with a even larger scale. Um, OK, so um, now for to my questions. Um, you are responsible for the verification activities at Odom, primarily for political science papers, and have been doing this for quite some time now. Can you describe the process at Odom and how has this been received by authors and editors? Sure, I'd be happy to. And thank you so much for, for having me. Um, so as, as you mentioned, we have been working with two political science journals since 2015, um, performing the reproducibility work, the verification work on behalf of the journals. Um, we have been doing this, like I said, since 2015, and in total, um, about 608 articles. I just looked before this panel to see how many we've we've gone through. Um, for this, I'm going to speak primarily about our experience with AJPS. The um, State Politics and Policy Quarterly Journal was um, very much based off on the AJPS policy implementation. And so this policy, like others have mentioned, um, when the final draft of the, of the manuscript is submitted, then the materials um, are, are submitted to a repository where the Odom Institute um, pulls them down and we confirm that they do reproduce the analytic results reported in the article. 
So the way the process works, the, the manuscript is submitted. Um, it goes through the peer review process where it's conditionally accepted. And this is when the author is prompted to submit their package and submit their materials to the um, designated repository, which is a Dataverse repository. And then we have a team of both data curators and verifiers. So our data curators will pull the things down from the repository and review the materials to make sure that they're complete, everything is there. And then we have advanced graduate students who actually um, run the code and look at the outputs. And actually one of our veteran uh, verifiers is on the call, Rosemary. Uh, we also have the support of um, professional statisticians um, at the Odom Institute. And so if uh, the verification does not pass, then the author is prompted to resubmit their materials. And that cycle repeats until finally everything looks good. And then the paper is considered, um, is given the final acceptance. And then we publish the data in the repository and the article is forwarded for publication. Um, one of, so this is also just a, a closer look at what we're looking at when we're performing that review. Um, like I said, we have both data curators and verifiers, and um, maybe it's because we're from a repository uh, that we um, want to make those two things distinct. We have two goals. One is the reproducibility. The code runs and produces the same outputs that are reported in the manuscript. But we also want to make sure that the materials um, will be able to be accessed and rendered um, over the long term. So we, with curation, we do look for completeness. We do look, look at confidential, confidentiality and copyright issues that may affect access. Um, we're looking at uh, missing variable definitions, so all of the descriptive um, information. Um, but we're also looking at those file formats. You want to make sure that they are suitable for long-term preservation. So if we receive something like a doc file, we'd want that to be converted into a PDF or a text file. And then also in the repository record, we add additional descriptive metadata to make sure that these data sets, um, these packages are discoverable. And then with the verification piece, this is where um, the verifiers go in. They need to configure the computational environment based on the documentation that was provided. They review the code to make sure that it has all of the commands and comments required to run the code and reproduce the results. And then they and then they do the work, compile, execute, confirm that it runs all the way through. And then they do compare the outputs to the results presented in tables, figures, and inline results. So it is a very much um, labor intensive and it takes a lot of time um, and thus it also costs a lot. And so one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how we can how can we reduce the cost Cost of this? How can we prevent so many rounds of, of verification? Um, so some of the things that we've been looking at, every time we every time we perform the verification, we send a report to the editor who then forwards it to the author. So in those reports, both the curators and the verifiers do detail all the issues that they found and oftentimes some suggestions for how to fix those errors. So these are some of the common things that we've seen. So the incomplete files, just like um, Ben mentioned, um, some of the files we can't get to because they're proprietary or um, otherwise uh, not um, accessible. Uh, sometimes the analysis workflows are hard to follow. The outputs don't match. So these are some of the issues when we we've been doing a study on all of those verification reports just to kind of zero in on what are those problem areas. And so what we see a lot are a lot of those documentation issues. That, that's the issue that comes up the most, but the ones that are really causing a lot of the time and effort really are the issues of file access because they're copyrighted, proprietary, um, sensitive, and also the issues with trying to set up the computational environments so that things run the way it would on the author's machines. So these are two of the areas that we're trying to um, figure out some technologies. There's some other ways to um, prevent these issues from happening. So. Basically, um, some of the, the things that we found in our experience since 2015 is that um, even though it is tough for authors, even though they may have to go through several rounds, and um, in our case, the average is two resubmissions after the, um, after the original submission on average, but they really are supportive of the policy and the goals. So I've done some interviews with some of the authors who have gone through this process, and, and I hear this from, from 
all of them that I spoke to that they they appreciate it, they think we should be doing it. Um, and also the policy didn't deter researchers from submitting their manuscripts to AJPS. And of course that's because AJPS is one of the top tier journals in the field and there are career incentives for being published in that journal. Um, I know that there have been um, some concerns from other editors that uh, they're concerned that this would affect their manuscript submission numbers, but we have not seen that. Um, and then the other thing we found is that that the verification failures, it wasn't the case that they're not capable of producing these high quality materials and writing clean code, um, but it really is unclear policy expectations. So having them understand, you know, when we say we want a code book um, to be really explicit about what that needs to look like, having exemplars that they can look at to see um, what a, a good uh, package should look like. So these are the three things that we found recently in some preliminary um, research that we've done. And then the other thing um, that I want to point out, um, based on our experience, when I do speak with other editors, these are a few things that I tell them um, will help them prepare to have a successful implementation of their policy. So one is community readiness, that the, the community um, that the journal serves is prepared. They understand it. They accept it. And they're aware of it. So it doesn't come as a surprise. Uh, the other thing is the policy adoption. So the policy, when it is issued, it does need to be clear. It needs to outline those specific actions, like I mentioned, um, so that they understand what they really need to do, what the expectations are. Um, the thing that we also found in our experience in the beginning, um, you know, the the time that it took was a lot longer. So in the beginning it was maybe nine hours and now we're down to four hours. And part of that is because we've been creating more resources, more documents, more guidance materials for authors to follow to help them understand what they need to do to create a high quality package. Um, and also in some cases, why it is that we might ask for them to convert a doc file into a PDF file, for example. Um, the other thing is, um, being sure, and this is one of the frustrations that that Ben or one of the challenges that Ben mentioned is the the infrastructure. So if there's a way we can adapt or expand the editorial infrastructure to accommodate the policy implementation, ideally there would be something in Manuscript One or the Manuscript Submission System that would link to our processes. Right now it is um, manual through email and and other means, but whatever that may be, whether it's manual or somehow magically automated, that needs to be established because there's so many moving parts in this process. And then finally, um, having the computational co computational and human resources available to execute those workflows, like I said, it is very time and labor intensive. So making sure you have not only the systems to run some of the more complex um, uh, computations, but also the people with the expertise to do that. And so I will stop there, but that has been our experience. Thank you. Thank you uh, to my. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists for the thought provoking and interesting material, and I will now open up the webinar to questions again. Um, so please enter any further questions you have uh, in the chat, the Q&A, and we welcome further queries to a particular panelist or broader questions directed to one or more panelists. As before, um, I will be monitoring the Zoom chat for questions as well, so, um, so we can go ahead and actually um, I have a question to start. Um, I'll go back to the beginning. So I'll go back to Christophe. Uh, Christophe, you briefly mentioned economies of scale. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, about that. Uh, and I want, would like you to expand a bit on, um, on what you mean by that. Yeah, so I, 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 I do think it's, uh, it's very important that, um, you know, one we we develop th those skills, and then we can we can share this these skills with a, a large number of journals. Um, I, I use this example uh, that we have in France, uh, but we can we can use other examples um, because uh, we have dozens of economic journals publishing papers uh, using the same data source. If we spend the time. We, we pay the cost of accessing a given source of data. I think it makes sense that all the journals ask us or someone else, but uh, we'll already have this experience with this data provider instead of starting from scratch and doing themselves. So I think it's a, 
in terms of uh, accessing data source, it's, uh, it can be super time consuming, especially if you do like we do, like what Lars is doing, or other, really checking the computational reproducibility, really like uh, uh, reproducing the whole results. And uh, so for this, you need all the code, you need all the data. And um, so that's one example. Uh, also expertise in terms of uh, computing environment, uh, you know, when the, Sometimes when you when you when you com conduct this uh, verification, you may you may find you know a large number of softwares or the uh, languages, and uh, so it's very important that to to rely on maybe a like a pool of of people like having like this uh, maybe a C plus plus expertise, which you may not have in your in your own journal with your like a, a handful of uh, PhD students or uh, uh, specialized. So that's another source of. Uh, um, uh, economies of scale uh, in terms of softwares and, and, and languages. Thank you, Christoph. Um, we have a question from, uh, from the Q&A from uh, Mario Maliki. Um, he's asking, what is the cost of running these services at these journals? So I guess the, 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 the question is, is probably more for Tumai or, or for Ben. And um, what is the staff number of the journal? So here uh, we're... Uh, we're looking at uh, the cost side. Uh, I guess I also have a cor corollary question, which we can expand on after, is who should bear these costs? Because um, this is costly. So I can start with that. That's a, a common question. So I think it just depends on the labor costs, but I mentioned that it takes on average about four hours to complete the entire process for a particular manuscript. Um, I think our costs are running about 350, 400 um, per manuscript. So, you know, it can add up and that can be very uh, cost prohibitive for some journals. Um, with AJPS, that is supported by the Midwest Political Science Association. So so they cover those costs. I know not all journals are backed by a large uh, uh, professional organization, but this is why it's so important for us to figure out how we can reduce the number of resubmissions, whether that is um, training or, or new systems to streamline the process, but we're looking at various angles to reduce that cost. Hmm. I mean, yeah, at, at Management Science, it's currently free, right? So um, it's, it doesn't cost anything, but it's obviously, as an economist, there's no free lunch. So uh, I'm spending at least a day of my week on this job, right? Uh, so that's um, uh, one-fifth of a professor salary. I have three associate editors who are all postdocs, assistant profs, so they spend at least half a day per week. So so if you add up these costs, then you get uh, to a ball, basically the same ballpark as Tumai just mentioned uh, per, per uh, paper. Uh, but in kind of implicit costs, and that's a problem. So we don't have any budget at the moment and any anything like that. And uh, there's a debate about that, obviously, and um, we'll see how we how we get there, right? Yeah, neither of you has, has mentioned um, um, cost of accessing data sources that are not currently accessible. Um, and I guess that's where that's where Christophe comes in, for example, with his service of having already um, paid access fee or secured access um, to various types of data. So what 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 do you do to my or, or Ben if the data are confidential? Do you just you 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 give up in a sense, um, or do you try to dig and and find find a way to call Cascade, call key stuff? So for us, we do try to find a way to access the data. One of the easiest thing, well, it's not easy, but one of the things that we try to do is have the authors contact the data provider to get permission for us to access it for the purposes of verification. We have also gone through the same protocols the author has gone through to access the data. So we've signed data use agreements. Um, the And then there's some cases where it's just impossible, where you'd have to fly to Sweden in order to access and use these data. So in those cases, that's when the, the editors will have to um, make the decision whether or not to um, give an exemption to the policy. But we've never, we've never um, come into um, an issue where we've had to um, pay, not yet. Yeah, that's very interesting. So we basically, I mean, we don't have the capacity, so we to deal with that, right? So when the data cannot be included, we can't check the code. That's just we look at log files, but that's basically it, and we give up. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I'm I'm very interested in that. So it would be great to have agreements with these data publishers, these data data providers like Wharton Research Database, for example, to 
have either access for us and we do have through our institutions so we use that if you can right so um, but or or even for other users who want to replicate uh, results or reproduce results to have access maybe even uh, kind of disguise data where there are no identifiers so that you can actually only use that for the purpose of reproduction and not for original new research but yeah, I don't have experience with that in negoti negotiating with these providers. And the service like Kostov provides might actually be very helpful. Yeah. So then I have a, a question for Christophe. Christophe, would you charge do, do, Cascade? Do they do they charge journals for verification services, or is it a service that who pays basically? Is it the author? Is it the journals? Is it uh, a funder? Yeah, so we, we launched Cascade ju just before COVID, like uh, it was three years ago. And um, so we got funding from the French uh, Science National Foundation. Uh, so in terms of organization, just uh, as, as a compliment, we are just like three of us, two professors and one full-time um, verificator. Um, so it's a small, it's a small uh, structure, but it's, it's expensive because our employees, a full-time employee is not... Uh, it's not a it's not a PhD student. He's an engineer, so it's a it's it's kind of labor intensive and kind of costly. Uh, right now, our users um, they have been able to use our service for free uh, because we got enough funding to start the, the the process. But now we are kind of more successful, uh, uh, so we we kind of uh, we need to to find a more sustainable business model. So we are in the process of uh, asking journals to to pay when they ask uh, us to to. To verify a paper for them, um, so that's kind of the, the the transition that we are that in process of of doing. Um, and then going back to your question about the cost of accessing data, um, I think we, we should think not only in terms of you know uh, sub, uh, not only uh, in terms of fees, but also in terms of time, in terms of administrative burden. Uh, it was uh, to my, we mentioned before, accessing data from Sweden. We, we do apply and we have been able to access confidential data in Sweden, in Germany. I talked a lot about France for obvious reasons, but um, we are located in, in, in France and then in continental Europe. So sometimes you must be a researcher in continental Europe to have the right just to apply. Uh, we also uh, access data from a large number of central banks in, in Europe. So again, the cost is not only in terms of money, it's also in terms of time. Yeah, thank you. Um, leaving the issue of cost, um, we have another question from Mario Maliki uh, that's asking um, the impact on authors. So you have touched a little bit upon this issue, uh, both Tumay and, and, and Ben. Um, so do you think the authors are more likely to submit manuscripts um, having already checked computational reproducibility, um, or is it seen only as a requirement due to the journal? So um, do they do they fulfill the requirement even before they submit, or is a, a, an ex post sort of now my paper is accepted and I need to um, uh, pro provide that package? So in my experience, I mean, it puts a little bit more pressure on authors to be transparent from the beginning, to script everything, right? Uh, I remember back in the times where everyone worked with Excel files. Now people use R scripts, data scripts, and can document by scripting everything, everything from beginning to end. And that's very important. I see that myself because I'm a code and data editor and I push a lot of authors towards uh, providing better packages for my own papers now i have to be perfect right because um basically it puts a little pressure on me and i see now how i really from the beginning in each project i start documenting everything and scripting everything to make really sure that at the end i can provide uh, sufficient documentation so i think it puts pressures many authors are also thankful for our uh, uh for our comments and they are very happy in the beginning we had some resistance so why do i have to provide log files why do i have to do this and so on but this is changing also because the department editors they're not always experts in these replication uh, things but they at least understand the issue and they're pushing authors towards more transparency and they make clear to them that this is a condition right and that's very important that the community understands that this is required now and uh, they are, they can't any we don't have any kind of reduction in in submission numbers or anything like that we have uh, that's on the other hand uh, submission at management science is free 
All right, so there's no submission fee. And there has been some debate about whether we should charge submission fees in order to co-finance these kind of uh, things. Uh, so far, that, yeah, there, there was a lot of debate about it, but there's no change. Right? Would the fee be, um, it would be at submission, so it would be whether or not your paper is accepted? I, I don't know. I mean, we, that's, we that's, a diff that's a discussion, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I would say from some of the conversations I have had with the authors, um, I think I think like like Ben said, I think something that's been important in political science is that this conversation has been ongoing, and I think it's becoming an expectation that you do have, um, you know, uh, reproducible code. Um, but one thing that I think is really exciting about this is I asked them, you know, have their practices changed since having gone through this process? Not necessarily for another journal, but just, you know, have they learned something from it? And the vast majority of them said that they did. They do things do, they do things differently. They do keep their code and they clean it up a little more. Um, they are documenting more. I think they they do see the value of what we're trying to do. And so that's something that's probably the most exciting thing for me about this this experience. Thank you. Um, we have a, another question from the audience uh, from Limor Peer. The question is, what do you think is the impact of publishing verified replication packages and how do or would you measure the impact on science? Not directed at anyone, maybe Christophe, do you have a, um, do you have a something? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. The, the question is about was about uh, making public those uh, replication packages, so, which yeah, have been. Is, the question is about the impact. So, uh, yeah. what is the impact, and and how would you measure it? Um, how could you measure it? Would you measure it? <laughs> yeah. In in terms of impact, just like to to emphasize what was mentioned by the the other panelists. You know, the, the number one impact is that, at least in economics, finance, which are the field I know the best, you can really see an impact on the way we we work, the way we think about our code, the, we think about our data. Uh, it's really like a shift in, in mindset, I would say. Because at, at the beginning, when we, we, we started this, we were like dealing with papers, which, as you know, in economics, it takes years sometimes three, four, five years. So we were dealing with papers which were initiated five years plus ago. And five years ago, very few people talked about that. And now I can see the new generation. And then since day one, especially if they are very ambitious and they want to publish in those top three, top five journals, they know that at one point they will be either verified uh, with competition uh, reproducibility verification like we do, or like more like a very uh, serious verification of the code like Ben mentioned before. Um, so that's the number one impact. Um, whether the quality of the research is going to be improved, whether citation are going to go up, there's like mixed evidence about that, but maybe my co-panelists would like to elaborate on this. So, so I think, I mean, it has an impact in terms of stimulating also further new research, right? So people can now, if I want to run a new uh, finance paper and, and uh, I'm wondering about techniques other people used, I can just look them up, right? So it stimulates mm -hmm. new science, right? And new ideas and, and gets people already to a point where they, they don't have to get to this point by themselves anymore, but they can really rely much better on previous papers. I think that's hopefully a big impact. And the second thing is that, yes, um, that we get all, gain also more trust. There has been this reproducibility crisis in psychology, in in also in, in economics partly. And um, the idea is that we gain more trust by being more transparent and that people learn that things can be reproduced. So I'm very much looking forward to our results of our projects. Um, I can say that introducing the policy increased the reproducibility definitely because we have now replication packages we didn't have them before but it will, will be very interesting to see how many actually are allowed to reproduce fully the results of a paper and um, we want to improve that right so what one thing that 
that uh, I'm concerned uh, about is a little bit permanence, right? So the permanence of these replication packages, how can we ensure that even in 20 years, these things are still available? And um, I mean, projects like Cascade come, they get funding, but if there are no funding anymore, then they might die, right? So they don't know what happens then to these replication packages. Private companies have the same issue, right? They have a life cycle. So the question, big question is really, how can we ensure that we, uh, that we, make things permanent and at management science we basically have our own replication server for this reason and we don't accept any github things or whatever we want everything on our server because that's the most permanent thing we can think of but the big question is really how to ensure permanence of these things um i would be interested in christoph's into my um, um views on this well, of course, I would say the, repo the, the data repositories. So um, I think the, the data repositories, uh, the archives world, we're really thinking about how to um, uh, how to preserve these replication packages so that they do work in the future, whether it's, you know, containers or, or what have you. But I think um, something that we incur and the reason why it made sense for the for the archives to get involved in this is because um, there is that there is that question about long term preservation. So uh, we always encourage a partnership with the journals and a data repository so that we can solve some of those problems together. But certainly, you know, we keep all the materials in perpetuity. So I think that's something that um, I would encourage. I I also have a, a following up on that to my I, you mentioned. Um issues with the computational environments and um what do you think are some technologies that would help you um uh, fix those problems or, or reduce those kind of problems well this is a topic of a lot of working groups right <laughs> international working groups um but people always bring up containers um some people bring up you know emulation of different uh environments or lots of projects around that i think it's still an open question but um, the recognition that this, you know, that technology is ephemeral, things change, you know, if we were to try to, um, you know, rerun the code on replication package that we verified five years ago, you know, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't run. Um, but, you know, there, there's the other piece, you know, there's the technology, but there's also practices. So the, the documentation um, that we are so um, picky about when it comes to declaring, you know, what the what the technical requirements are. But, you know, this is something, you know, I wish I had an answer to it, but it's an ongoing challenge. And I guess how would you, okay, so Christophe, when you when you do your verification at Cascade, you issue a certificate, that, that's correct. And so um, is this certificate accepted at, let's say, uh, your journals uh, to my invent? Would you be, okay, then I don't have to do anything. I, I believe Cascade, then I'm done. Or, you know, how would your process looks like, look like once you have a service like Cascade that, that does uh, help you in, in that verification? I think, I think we would be certainly open to it if, if our standards and the requirements align. Um, I think there's a possibility and, and really I, it make our, our jobs a lot easier knowing that somebody's already gone through these packages and, and did the work so we don't have to do it again. And Lars would probably talk about some other initiatives for, for um, you know, reducing, reducing that additional effort. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how this evolves. Um, so when I when I saw um, that Cas Cascade um, pop up several years ago, I was very excited. Yeah, what well, to my set, I can just sign up to this. Just as a clarification, when you mentioned Maria, this uh, certificate, it's it's uh, it's only when we have researchers approaching us and requesting a verification. Uh, they initiate the process, okay, and it's very early. It's pre pre submission, okay, and then we deliver a certificate, and then that's a, one one thing we do. Another thing we do is, and when Lars or other data editors, they kind of send us a request for a paper that, for whatever reason, they don't have the data or they may don't have the time. I don't know. Um, they outsource part of the verification to us, and in that case, we don't deliver a certificate. In that case, we deliver um, a verification report, and then we explain all the different steps of what we have been doing, any problems that we faced, any problems that we solved, any problems that we were unable to solve, this type of thing. And then we ship this report to the data editor, 
and then he or she will decide uh, what is the next uh, step uh, for this process for this job for this uh, paper there's another question here so uh uh especially to my and ben you described and it's the process that i'm familiar with also being a data editor um you do the you get the package you do the first uh run and then you discover some issues whatever they are you go back to the author with those issues have you had cases where where there's disagreement so the author goes no no there's no problem uh the con the code runs on my computer and you're like no the code doesn't run so um have you had this, these issues and how do you deal with those disagreements so I think that happens often and it is, you know, and it is a matter of the computational environments, but the goal of this is not only that it runs on their own computers, but that, it, but that it's independently understandable for informed reuse. So we expect that other people will be able to run the stuff. Um, you know, I mean, there's some simple things like when they declare their, their file paths, it's not acceptable for them to have, you know, their own drop personal Dropbox. So we, we do have to, um, teach them that that they need to think about their their code as its own standalone program so there's a little nudging there it does happen and sometimes it can be difficult because there's some really strange things that might happen with different versions of software or different um, operating systems but we've always been able to resolve them on the most part but even with the disagreement I think it's really rare that we see something that changes the the conclusions of the paper um, and so there's probably some thinking about that, you know, how how close, how exact, but um, but really it's it's part of that is is that you know the the computational environment is an important component to uh, our standard for reproducibility. Yeah, so so most most of these things can be resolved, right? Uh, the the more debates we have is about, for example, about data delays. So some authors hand collected a data set and they want to still exploit it and they don't want to share it yet. And so we, but we require them that they provide us with everything and then we post a delay. And I see it as part of my job to really push always for earlier delay and for and and no code delay at all, but if at all only data. And these kind of things. So I see a part of my job is pushing in one direction. And often this actually helps and, and and they they notice that well, we could just, you know, obfuscate some part of the data and then we can publish everything right away and these kind of things. So we often find solutions somewhere in the middle and compromises, I think. So I hadn't had a case where there was no agreement in the end. There's one last question, and it, it's it's probably quick unless you well it will be quick if you don't have an answer. Uh, there's a question here about do you know in your field what is the percentage of journals that reproduce results like you do? Uh, so it's not all the journals, but do you have an idea of uh, what fraction? I think there are more journals in political science. Well, I, I say more as in more than the ones that we're doing, but um, I mean I don't have the exact number, but it's very very few. I have the exact number in my field, finance, Excellent. it's zero. <laughs> uh, well, or economics, you... I can guess, uh, but I don't have the exact number. But in economics, uh, as you may know, we have uh, hundreds of journals, but at least in the among the, um, the very good ones, we see the, an increase in the number of journals uh, requesting this type of thing. Uh, Ristod, we mentioned, uh, of course, the uh, journals uh, managed by the American Economic Associations. All of them, uh, conduct the, the type of uh, computational reproducibility check that we mentioned today. Um, so it's really a, a growing number of economics, but I don't know the exact number. So management science has a finance department. We are not in the top five, but we are kind of top six or top seven or something like that. So they are at least a part of it. Um, and I think, yeah, so in, in the management, so INFORMS is the society which publishes management science, and they are also computation journals, they are operations management journals, and so on. And more and more journals take it over. So we have also the Journal of um, uh, so Marketing Science, for example, a marketing journal starting to look at our processes and thinking about copying it. But sometimes they are also just computation journals where they have software, so they have a completely different review. They already review during submission and not only after acceptance, but we get like 4,000 submissions. We can't do that at the scale, right? So so that's uh, the difference. But I think uh, there's a change and more and more journals trying to pick it up. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, uh, that's our time, but I want to thank our, our speakers, Christophe Perignon, Ben Greiner, and to my Christian for presenting and our audience members for attending and asking questions.
our next session is on March 28th, 2023, at our usual time at 4.15 p.m. Eastern, when we discuss why can or should research institutions publish replication packages. Please register. And as always on our website, uh, we hope to see you. Uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you.